Well, good evening and uh, welcome to this midweek uh, talk. I, uh, I hope you've got your tea uh, ready. Well, it's always good to have a cup of tea uh, as we start uh, thinking uh, about this midweek talk. You know, I want to pull a few thoughts out this evening about Peter and actually I want to do this through looking at some of the threes that we find in the passages around Gethsemane and uh, the kind of arrest of Jesus. And so, you know, to, to go straight in, uh, we find in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus left his three disciples to pray. And then Jesus went off and he prayed three times. And each time as he came back to the three disciples, they were asleep. Uh, he had said to them, you know, watch and pray that you won't fall into temptation. Uh, but in verse 41, it says, when he returned to them the third time, he said, go ahead and sleep uh, to them. And so Jesus praying three times, Peter, James and John sleeping three times uh, in that picture. And, and it's an interesting backdrop, isn't it, to what happens next? Uh, because Judas arrives as the betrayal, as the arrest. And, you know, Jesus heads to be uh, standing in front of the high priest, the Sanhedrin, and Peter heads to stand in front of a fire and warm himself there. And what's interesting, again, is after the false witnesses have come and they can't, you know, they don't have anything on Jesus, the high priest stands up and he asks three sets of questions. And, and it's like Mark is wanting us to see the parallel between the three sets of questions that are asked Jesus or those that are with Jesus and the three questions that are asked Peter. So the first question that the high priest asked Jesus is in uh, verse 60. And it says, well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? And in verse 61, it says that Jesus was silent that he made no reply. Echoes of Isaiah 53 verse 7, where it talks about, you know, that picture of the Messiah of Jesus, in this case, heading towards um, the, the, like a sheep, heading towards the shearers is silent. Here we see Jesus doing exactly that. The second question that the high priest asks is, you know, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? To which Jesus said in verse 62, I am. You know, all through Jesus' ministry, when people saw who realised who Jesus was, Jesus has said, you know, don't tell anyone, keep it quiet. And, you know, when he was at the height of his ministry, when Peter, or when Peter confessed Jesus, or when he was transfigured, Jesus would say, you know, don't tell anyone about this. Keep it quiet. But now, Jesus, in that seeming place of weakness, arrested in front of the high priest, the ruling council as well, it appears that he's at the mercy of others, that he is powerless. And yet, it's at this moment that Jesus makes it clear to, to all those there who he is. To those who will then mock him and blindfold him and hit him. Jesus seems anything but the Messiah. But Jesus continues in that place and he says, and you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. You know, in this moment, Jesus seems like he's a captured lamb heading to be slaughtered. And yet... In these words of Jesus, we see where the power really is. And it's certainly not with those that are standing around Jesus. Because of what Jesus says, the high priest tears his clothes and the third set of questions come. He says, why do we need other witnesses? You've all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. And so on one hand, we have Jesus standing up and speaking out to the highest priest, the highest ruling council. And on the other hand, we have Peter standing by a fire in darkness. The spokesperson of the disciples, the one who spoke up, 
who had said that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, here he denies that he even knows Jesus. And not is he only doing that, he's doing it to the lowest of the low. And so you have the kind of the highest of the religious uh, authorities, and here you have the lowest, you have a servant, a girl, asking Peter about Jesus. And you know, as soon as he does this three times, we, we hear uh, the cock all crowing, and we know from the other accounts that at that moment, Jesus was taken across in the distance and their eyes connected. Peter had fallen asleep three times when Jesus told him to watch and pray. And now he denied Jesus three times when he said that, you know, even if he had to die for Jesus, he would never deny him. Imagine the pain as he looked across that courtyard and his eyes connected with Jesus's eyes. I don't know what that scene makes you feel. I've reflected upon it a lot and I think it makes me think about those times that I have failed Jesus, when I've messed up, when I've let him down, when I've been maybe confused with who Jesus is or what Jesus is up to. But, you know, at the same time, knowing deep down that I love him, that he is the Messiah, but yet still being able to make a mess of it and not live the life that I would like to live. And that picture of Jesus looking across the courtyard, you know, I was thinking if Jesus was to look at the courtyard, across the courtyard at you or me right now, what would he be wanting to say? What look would there be in his eyes? What would I want to say back to him? For Peter, after that glance, he, he broke down, he wept. Other accounts says that he ran, that he was a broken man. You know, Jesus had gone. This would be the last time he'd see him before the cross. Because to continue that theme of three, you could say three nails later, crucified as one of three people, there would be three hours of darkness. And then at three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus would cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus would at that moment die. For Peter, he'd have to wait three days to see his crucified Messiah come back to life. And over those three days, what must Peter have gone through? And you know, let's not forget that even in that time, as soon as the angels appear to the women, at the tomb. What do they say? Well, apart from Jesus being alive, obviously that was the headline news. He, they say, you know, go tell his disciples and Peter. We get Peter singled out. You know, Jesus knew the pain that he was going through, but he also saw what Peter would become in due time. So if you move from Mark into the end of John, and we go to John 21, we get one of the most powerful resurrection appearances. That time when Jesus appears on the beach, when he has a barbecue, uh, breakfast with his, some of his disciples, you know, because they'd gone back fishing, they'd caught nothing, a kind of similar picture that Jesus says, you know, kind of try the other side, or, uh, you know, in this side, this time it's like, you know, try the other side, and their nets begin to break. There's just so many uh, fish that's there that you know the nets just are too heavy even to pull on board and so they, they're, they're fished through the darkness of night uh, at the dawn the breaking of a new day there is Jesus once again performing miracles and John on the boat says to Peter it's the Lord and what does Peter do he doesn't wait uh, he wants to get straight to Jesus and he dives in and he gets to uh, Jesus and you can just sense the emotion. You know, Peter's so desperate to have time alone with Jesus. He wants to get there first. Just wonder what that must have been, that kind of time together as the other disciples were heading uh, with the fish and the boat. You know, after they have a meal of bread and fish, 
they have that time. Jesus and Peter. And it says that this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. But Jesus wants to helpfully deal with all that's gone before. And so as they sit by the side of a fire, Jesus asks three questions. So let's hear those questions from John 21. It says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. You know, Peter, some 30 years after this time on the beach, would be crucified for his faith. He would lay down his life for Jesus. But this day, as he sat by that charcoal fire, exactly the same kind of fire as he'd sat by and denied Jesus three times, Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? It's a powerful, you know, Peter had tried his hardest, but he got things wrong. He'd messed up, he'd let Jesus down, he got confused about what was going on, he just didn't understand everything. He'd not laid down his life, he'd denied him. And for us, isn't it, it's so easy for us to, to mess up, to, to let Jesus down, to miss opportunities, to misunderstand who Jesus is at times and, and get things wrong. So I wonder if we were to sit down and have breakfast with Jesus, what would you want to talk to him about? And what would he want to talk to you about? You know, as we think about this fire being the kind of fire of restoration, you know, what questions would Jesus ask you? And how would you respond? You know, deep down, Peter loved Jesus in all of his confusion about what was going on around the cross. You know, he didn't run away. It's interesting that he was there when Mary and the women came back and they'd seen angels and that him and John ran down to the tomb. And it's interesting that it was Thomas who was missing, not Peter, when Jesus appeared to the disciples. And yet Peter needed this time around the fire with Jesus to work things through, to sort things out, to be restored to the person that God wanted him to be and become. And as we think about Jesus, you know, he's looking right now into the core of our being. We can't have a mask or pretend anything with God. Jesus needed to get the kind of old Peter out of the way so that the new Peter could become the leader of the early church. Peter came to know that you know, God's plan was always for a crucified Messiah. The first sermon that Peter preached after all this had taken place at Pentecost has these lines. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So what is Jesus wanting to work in you and me? What are the things that, you know, right now God might be wanting us to throw on the fire, so to speak, to remove, be removed from our lives so that we can burn even brighter for him? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for Peter. Thank you for his devotion. 
Thank you for his willingness some 30 years after this to lay down his life for you. Lord, we come knowing there are things that you want to work on in our lives. And so we ask you to come Holy Spirit, come Holy Fire of God. Refine us, purify us, help us to throw away all those things that hinder, that we may run that race for you. Come and cleanse us, come and heal us, come and restore us, that we would live for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May we take time to ponder these words and uh, may God bless you.